Today I'm going to show you what's inside of the Volkswagen 5 cylinder engine and how it works. Now Volkswagen and Audi have been using 5 cylinder engines for a little while up until recently. This engine is out of a 2008 Volkswagen Golf City or Rabbit. And we're going to be tearing this engine down just to see what makes it unique. Now taking a look around this engine here, this is actually the front of the engine here where the crank pulley and accessories will bolt up to. This here is the exhaust manifold which will be against the firewall. This is a transversely mounted vehicle. At the top here we've got plastic valve cover, aluminum alloy head, a steel steel block and then an aluminum alloy upper oil pan the lower oil pan is stamped steel but it's missing now coming around to the back of the engine here we where the transmission would mount up to we have the timing chain set up you have a double overhead cam set up over here and this is actually part of the timing cover this is kind of the reason why I couldn't mount this on the engine stand because they don't have any bolt holes on the front of the engine to mount it backward looking over here at the intake side we've got a plastic intake plenum a drive-by wire throttle body of course this is just port injected with this fuel rail over here the giant thing on top of the valve cover is the positive crankcase ventilation system which has a little diaphragm inside that often fails. I think I'm going to start up at the front of the engine here by taking off all of these plugs and hoses. Probably get sprayed with coolant while doing so. Okay I'm going to first start by removing this throttle body get a little more clearance. Notice they've actually clamped these hoses instead of using the constant tension clamps. I'm next working on removing this fuel rail and one thing I like is that they've actually got a screw right here where you can plug in your fuel pressure gauge if you need to diagnose the fuel pump issue. The other thing I don't like is that the fuel pipe is actually just a regular tubing just like coolant with a regular connection. It's not one of those quick lock connections that are difficult to get out. It's probably good for coolant but probably not good for fuel pressure which could potentially cause a fire. Alright my first triple square I'm trying to get this little hook off here which is actually the same piece that holds this wiring harness on. There we go. Now the top part of this intake is held on by six millimeter hexes all the way around. So I'm just going to buzz those off. So I've tilted the engine back a little bit and it's cool because this thing actually looks like a little starter mounted near the transmission, but it's not. I'm going to remove these bolts here for the intake. I'm going to use a special pliers here to disconnect this electrical harness. Move that out of the way and disconnect this one here again without damaging anything. I'm going to try to get this thermostat assembly out of here. Imagine doing the thermostat on the car. It must be so cumbersome. And this here is the thermostat. All right, next up we've got the oil cooler located directly onto the block. You can see we've got the coolant part of it over here and the oil filter assembly down at the bottom here with a vacuum tube. These are held on with triple squares again and they're really rusty. So I'm just going to use my brother's old toothbrush here. Clean out these triple squares because they can strip out pretty easily. These are an M10 triple square. I'm going to loosen this off here. I'm expecting oil to come out like crazy. Well, I found my lady's pajamas on my side of the bed, so I'm going to go ahead and use that to sap up some of this oil as well as the coolant. Only fair game. I'm going to try to remove this thermostat housing. Okay. Now, this is by far one of the most stupidest designs ever. The only other one that matches this is pretty much the Honda D series. This intake bolt is way underneath here and unlike the other ones that have access ports that you can get it from above, this one does not have any access port which means that how am I supposed to put a tool on that? And you can only imagine removing all this crap just to get this intake off while it's in the vehicle. And of course it's a 6mm hex and not like a proper 10 millimeters heads or something that you can use a wrench on. Well I found a 730 seconds Erlen key from my wife's birthday gift a couple years ago and it actually works. She gave me a wardrobe because her closet was getting too full and it came with this handy little key. I don't care too much about the wardrobe though. All right now I should finally be able to pull off this intake. I'm going to go ahead and remove the dipstick out of the way and now I can get this intake off finally. All right next up I'm going to remove all these valve cover bolts so we can get it off. Whoa, it's clean. Oh, so these coil pack connectors are just friction fit. They don't have any bolt holding them down. Taking a look underneath here, it looks like this engine had its fair share of maintenance. It's almost pretty much brand new inside of here. We've got dual overhead camshafts and you can tell that they're actually a hydro formed one versus a solid one that's machined. We've got a cam carrier, which is this tray over here that sits on top of these camshafts as opposed to individual cam caps. And then there's actually these hydraulic roller arms underneath here that'll press down on the cam and you don't have to do valve adjustments because it's hydraulic. So here we are at the front of the engine. You can see this is the timing cover. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove all these T30s going around. And there's the timing cover. So there's actually a coolant pass through right in between the timing cover. We've got this little alloy here, the lower radiator hose connects to it, and the coolant temperature sensor. Kind of a leak point if you ask me. Taking a look underneath this timing cover, and once again, wow, this thing is really well taken care of. It's absolutely clean in here. You can see we've got our variable valve timing intake gear over here. The exhaust does not have variable valve timing. Simple dual overhead cam setup with the two plastic timing chain sliders. This here is the tensioner assembly over here. 
Now this chain is actually going to go down to an intermediary gear over here where it's going to power this vacuum pump. Alright, next up we're going to remove the lower timing cover. These are a triple square M8. Just going to get this valve out of the way here. This is a regular 10 mil. Triple squares, Torx, hexes, regular 10 millimeters. Once again, Volkswagen's been doing the same thing by using all different kind of fasteners just to make it more difficult for us who want to destroy these cars. Couple more bolts for the lower timing cover. Here's the lower timing cover. You can see it's integrating the crank position sensor down there. And here you can see the full timing setup of this Volkswagen five cylinder engine. It's a little bit more complicated than a typical four cylinder where it goes crank to camshaft. In this case here we start with a crankshaft which is going to spin this little counter gear over here which goes inside to the oil pump. Here we've got some metal slides on this side and a plastic slide on this side that takes it over to the intermediary gear which powers the vacuum pump. That intermediary gear also powers the cam chains which power the intake and exhaust camshafts over here. And the timing chain tensioner for it is located over here and the chain tensioner for this one is located over here. Not too difficult, it's just two different chains with an intermediary gear. They could have simplified things like other four cylinder engines. Next up, I'm going to remove all these Torx T30 on this camshaft ladder cradle over here. Now, I've snapped several other T30s and other Audi engines, so I'm going to break these free instead of using the impact first. There we go. Go off the camshaft. And the other camshaft here. And the chain. I'm going to remove this tensioner over here on the head. It's got spring and hydraulic tension on it. And then I can remove these slides over here. Here's the gasket over here. That's because the tensioner is oiled. And then remove the slider over here. Now that the cam cover and cam shafts are out of the way, you can see here the little roller. And this roller is hydraulically adjustable. Now before I get this head off, I gotta deal with this exhaust manifold. You can see at the top here, all the bolts are nice and accessible. But because this is a five in one unit, I don't have access to the bolts down below. So yeah, just like the intake down below here, you can see all of these nuts here are not accessible. I'm gonna have to go in here with a random ratchet and try to get these off. And to add to that, you can see they're really rusty. Or I could just take the whole head off with the manifold and deal with that later. All right, we're gonna lube her up. Get it nice and wet. Hate doing it when it's dry, it feels so wrong. All right, these are 13 mil or half inch. Guess there are 12 now. Too tight for a ratchet and a socket to go in there, so I'm gonna try this double wrench method. Okay, it's loose. Can you imagine trying to do this inside the car up against the firewall? You say you wanted to, I don't know, put a turbocharger on this or put some nice headers on. All right, finally I can get this exhaust manifold off. Anybody want my rusty nuts or my studs? Now the head bolts on these are a six point spline socket. This is a specific socket just for Volkswagen Audi engines that I bought. The socket alone is like 25 bucks and this is the cheap one. All right, now I'm gonna zip these off. All right, I'm gonna take off the head. And you can see we've got the unique five cylinder head gasket. Now taking a look inside the engine, you can see it actually looks pretty clean. There's not too much carbon build up inside of here. I would say this is a well maintained engine and it didn't really burn too much oil. This is an iron block engine so you can see it does use a semi closed block design around here. It's not completely open the way an aluminum block would. And you've got these little coolant passages that are drilled through these little pistons over here to allow coolant to pass through to the other side as opposed to flowing all the way around or flowing through the head to the other side. All right, back on the front of the engine here, I'm going to take off these timing components. A couple of T30s. This one too also has a spring and it's hydraulic. I'll knock off the oil pump. Here we go. Take off this slide and then take off this chain. It's just a single roller chain. I knock off these two bolts here. This piece slides off with this. Kind of like a fork that holds it in. Taking a look at the bottom of this engine here. Now this engine did not come with an oil pan, but I'm assuming it's some sort of a stamped steel design. Correct me if I'm wrong. Here you can see the oil pickup tube where it's going to draw in oil to the oil pump which was powered by that timing chain up at the front here. Gonna knock these bolts off. Here we have the upper oil pan which is an aluminum piece. It's got these baffles in it for the oil. There are 13 millimeter bolts that go all the way around. Now some of these were super loose indicating this thing could have been leaking and you can see they've also tried to incorporate their triple square on top of the hex design. Seems like someone couldn't make up their decision and use both. Alright, we'll just remove that now. Of course, as soon as I pack away my triple square set, there's more triple squares everywhere. So I'm going to go ahead and remove the oil pump next. 
take that off. Now this being a five cylinder engine, it has six main bearing caps over here for the crankshaft. A four cylinder is gonna have five of them, but the weird thing is a V6 only has four of them. Anyways, these are an M12 triple square. So here's another cool thing just before I buzz these bolts off. Cylinder one here is a top dead center and you'll notice how the cylinders two, three, four and five are all at different angles. That's because they have a 72 degree power stroke angle between each of them as opposed to like a four cylinder where it would be one and four in sync and two and three in sync. There's actually different angles to where these are located relative to the top dead center on piston one. And it's done like this so you get even power through the engine cycle otherwise you're gonna have power pulses through the powertrain. So here's the first main bearing. You can see it's got only got two bolts per bearing as opposed to four or six bolts in like a V6. Yeah, we need another socket type here. This is an E-Torx 10 for the connecting rod bearings. All right, I'm gonna take off the connecting rods here. Taking a look at all these connecting rod caps here, you can see that there's definitely some wear on the coatings over here. There's not too much scoring, maybe one or two lines over here. Here are the main bearings for the crankshaft. Once again, these are also in good shape, just some very minor scoring, but overall pretty good. I'm gonna remove the crankshaft, and push the connecting rods down so we can get the pistons out. So here I've got all the components laid out here. Let's have a closer look at how this engine works. Now we're going to start at the bottom of this engine here. Now if you remember, this has got the upper oil pan, which is made of aluminum. Now looking down inside of this cast iron block, you can see the six main bearings where the crankshaft is going to rotate against. We've also got these sprayers here that are going to spray the inside of the cylinder liner with oil. Now speaking of oil, here's the oil pump that would sit right up on top of here. The oil pickup tube would feed oil in through here, or the back of the engine actually, where the transmission is mounted, is a timing chain powered pulley which is going to power this oil pump and the output is going to go directly into the engine block. Now that oil is then going to be sent up through this hole here to this interface where we're going to have oil and coolant going into the oil cooler over here. Now this being a German car being made of plastic, it always has a tendency to leak, whether here it's at the gasket or at the interface with the oil cooler. Essentially you've got oil in and oil coming back out going into the block and you have coolant going in and coming back out. Now if there is an internal leak inside of here it's going to cause the um, oil and coolant to mix together and then you're going to get a milky residue. This one's even got a little flap over here but these are not really a very strong point in these German designed engines. Now oil from that cooler is then going to be sent down to the main oil galley which runs the length of the block to lubricate the interior. And inside here tapping off the oil galleys are these little sprayers which are going to spray the inside of the cylinder liners and there's a bore here inside of the main crankshaft pulley which is also going to take oil to lubricate lubricate the crankshaft. So far, at least with the block, this five-cylinder engine has been pretty simple. And here we have the crankshaft of this five-cylinder engine. This is really where this engine is kind of an anomaly, having five cylinders, kind of like that weird uncle you have who never really got married. Now, this is the front of the engine with the timing chain, which is actually the back of the engine where the transmission mounts up to. The firing order would be one, two, four, three, and then five. And they've done this in order to minimize the amount of vibration because it's a five cylinder engine and you have an odd number of pistons. The primary and secondary forces are gonna be quite significant because you don't have an even pair. In a four cylinder or a six cylinder engine, you have pairs of pistons that can kind of cancel each other out. You don't really have that choice in a five cylinder. Now, if we look at this in the torsional direction, each one of these connecting rods are about 72 degrees apart from each other, which means that torsionally, you're always gonna have a power stroke at any time of rotation of this engine. There's no gap in the power stroke like you would in a four cylinder engine. So you're always gonna have a smooth delivery of power in a torsional direction. So you can kind of see why these five bangers are a little weird because they're not really symmetrical or they don't really have good vibration characteristics. The only advantage here is that these exhaust notes sound really cool, kind of like a V10. Now taking a look at the pistons that came out of this engine. Now this had 155,000 kilometers on it. That's not that much. The reason why it's here is really because the transmission blew. You'll see that the engine wasn't really burning that much oil. It kind of has a concave shape to the pistons. There's not too much of a cut out here where the valves overlap the pistons themselves. The compression rings here are actually fairly loose and even the oil control rings here are loose although they are more of that smaller design that we're seeing on modern engines. Now the pistons themselves are relatively meaty. I can definitely see how they would ramp this up for the RS3 variants of this platform. Now taking a look at the top of this five cylinder block here of course you've got your oil feed and your drain back ports over here. This uses a semi-closed block design so you don't have an entire water jacket running fully around the cylinders. 
They actually have these reinforcement points around here. This is going to make a good foundation for a very simple engine that you can build very strongly because it's made of cast iron. Now this five cylinder also has an integrated water pump housing over here. So the impeller part, which is actually plastic, would come out here that you can replace. Housing itself is casted within the iron block. Now this is a 2.5 liter five cylinder engine. So you'll notice that the pistons are actually a little bit smaller than you typically would on a four cylinder of the same size. That's because this is an undersquare design where the stroke is a lot longer than the diameter. It's just kind of sad though that it only makes 148 horsepower for this displacement. Looking under the engine head here, you can see it's a very simple four valve design, two intake, two exhaust. The semi-closed block design kind of continues here where it brings all the coolant around the exhaust valves over here to cool them down. Now this head bolt hole here actually doubles as the oil passage which brings oil to lubricate components inside of the head. Now looking at the top of the head here, you can easily see the oil galley that runs along here, one for each side, and that's where these little roller arms sit with these hydraulic lash adjusters. Oil pressure is going to build up behind here, and that's going to take up any slack between this little roller here and the camshaft as it's rolling around, so you don't have to adjust the clearance between the valve and this little roller arm. Now furthermore, the intake side here features variable valve timing, so you have this variable valve timing solenoid here, which is going to take some of that oil pressure and send it in through these little holes here in the camshaft, and that's going to allow this phaser here to rotate, giving you better efficiency during certain combustion. I do have another video on how variable valve timing works, so you might want to check that out. What's also cool is that this camshaft here is hydroform, so essentially it's kind of like a pipe here. Then you have pressure that pushes down on these certain points over here, and the cam lobes here are pressed on. Now in terms of wear, I do notice there's a little bit of lines here on the camshaft wearing surface, especially this one out at the back here. Now one of the main failure points in most Volkswagen engines is this PCV system. Basically it's got a giant diaphragm in here that acts like an oil separator. Before shooting all that air out into the intake to get reburned and gum up your valves. Sometimes these fail causing a lot of oil to enter in and in order to replace this you basically have to replace the entire valve cover. It's quite a bit of a job for a part that another car would unscrew and be like five bucks or something. Let's see if I can get this off and show you. Yeah, you can see this diaphragm here would sometimes tear. It's no longer going to separate the oil from the air and it's all going to just be fed out through this pipe. Got a little spring over here to push it against it. Sometimes they do sell a kit for this that you can replace this piece but Often it's hard to really get this to seal back, so you got to replace the entire thing. Now looking down inside of the air intake here, you can see this is where the throttle body would mount, and the air has to move around this way within the air intake and straighten itself out before going into the head. And that's just there to make sure the airflow is nice and even across all five cylinders, and you can promote good mixing with these fuel injectors. And that's pretty much a look inside of Volkswagen's five-cylinder engine and how it works. Now I do have the failed automatic transmission sitting here for a teardown next, but in the meanwhile, make sure you subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this one. So the thing that I said that looks like a starter near the transmission actually looks like a coolant pump. So I'm going to see if I can take this apart using my torque socket. There we go. So we just remove the housing there. You got the inlet and the outlet. And then over here we have the impeller. And you can see this impeller is actually driven by an electric motor over here. Let's see if I can get this cover to come off. So we can take care of that. And just pull off that cover. That's just a dust cover. In fact, it's not far off from being a starter. It is an electric motor after all. So instead of just relying on the mechanical water pump, some circuits of the cooling will rely on this electric water pump.